Are we good to go? So welcome out everyone. It's been uh, a little bit of a delay since we last met. Uh, and tonight is section 14, our end times Bible study. Uh, today is September the 20th, 2022. So it's a good way to close out the summer season together. I'm glad to see it go. Uh, the best month of the year is up on us soon. <laughs> uh, but glad to hear it here. Hope to make some good progress tonight. Uh, what I'm going to deal with tonight, I, I was reminded of what Luke said at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. He said, Inasmuch as many have taken in the hand to write the things that he's about to write. So evidently, a lot of people wrote a lot of stuff about the ministry of Christ. Only a little bit of it got into the Bible. But everyone was writing it down, everyone writing, it, writing down their memories, their opinions, their thoughts. And I feel that way about Daniel's vision in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Uh, if you want to spend the rest of your life on the internet, on YouTube, just type in Daniel's 70 weeks. And I was scanning through some today, just kind of trying to get an idea of the flavor of what's out there. And I don't know of another passage in the Bible. There, there's probably a few, but that there are more opinions and everyone is right. Everyone says, this is the correct view. Everyone else is wrong. You got a hundred different views. So I'm going to be, like Luke said, I'm going to try my hand in the next few sessions at Daniel's vision and prophecy. The reason I'm doing that is because Jesus told us to. So we're in Matthew 24, but he said in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. It's almost as if Jesus is, is saying to us at this point, because he's covering, he's covering the period of time between his two comings and the events leading up to his return. But it's almost as if he stops and says, but... But when it comes to the abomination of desolation, you need to stop, you need to go to Daniel, because I'm not going to take the time to go on the details right now, but Daniel's already given the details. So go over there, find the abomination of desolation, and it is in four places, as all of them written right across here, four times, Matthew 24, 15, when, when you see the abomination, go to Daniel. Or when you read about it, go to Daniel. When you want to know anything about it, go to Daniel. And it's, it's so interesting that he didn't say go to Isaiah, he didn't say go to Ezekiel or Jeremiah, or even Moses. He said go to Daniel, because regarding this subject, and evidently uh, regarding the end times, this single event of the abomination of desolation, is like the major thing during that seven years that everything else kind of stacks up against. So you got to get that one square and where it fits and when it is and what it's about so that you can plug in all the other parts of those last seven years. So this abomination of desolation. So what we're going to do exactly what Jesus, what, recommended, uh, commanded, shouted. It's like he's... It's like he's really putting the emphasis of go over to Daniel. So I made this handout for you tonight. And we're going to look at seven points. Uh, anything before the seven points, if you want to write it down, uh, we will make seven major points tonight. So uh, I'll let you know when that starts. You may have to write on the other side before that or something. <laughs> but these... Uh, what I call anchor points from Matthew 24. And we went over this last week, but time stamps. But in 24:15, when? When you see the abomination of desolation. 24:21, then there shall be great tribulation. 
So what begins the great tribulation of the last three and a half years? The abomination of desolation. So that's the trigger for the last half of the seven years, which is called the great tribulation. So when and then, and then the other anchor point, I call it, is 24 verses 29 to 31. And at the end of that great tribulation, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the cosmic signs, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, sending out the angels to gather the elect, the resurrection, the rapture, that is Matthew 24, 29 to 30. So if you want to look at Matthew 24, it's kind of an overall sense. Those three passages are the anchor points. Then you plug everything else around those three passages. So when Jesus said, when you see the abomination standing in the holy place, uh, where was he when he said that? This is all going to fit into these seven points later. Where was he? He was sitting on the Mount of Olives. He was looking at the temple right across the Kibber Valley. The disciples came to him and said, when's all this going to happen? And he said, uh, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. What holy place was he talking about? Because I run up against this thing a lot that we're going to deal with tonight. This idea of a rebuilt temple, the starting of the sacrifices, of the Jewish religion practices again. That just sounds so far-fetched, doesn't it? It just sounds so bizarre. They're going to start sacrifices again? They're going, to, they're going to be on the temple now? They're going to build some kind of temple again? Will the Muslims let them? How is that going to happen? So a lot of people, maybe the majority, because of those obstacles in their mind, they say, well, that temple is really the church, you know, or it's some other kind of temple, you know, spiritualized what the temple means. It's not the temple in Jerusalem. It's not the literal temple. It's not literal sacrifices. It's, you know, they try to spiritualize and they're symbolizing it some way. And yes, the New Testament does talk about the church as the temple, and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's easy to kind of like force that in. But I keep coming back to where was Jesus when he said this, and what building was he looking at? And what would they conclude when he said, when you see the abomination standing in the one holy place? Well, they're looking at the building that has a place in it called the holy place. So, you know, sometimes we like we work too hard to make these things different when often the plain language is the plain conclusion. You know, Occam's razor, the simplest answer is often the right answer. You know, sometimes we try to try to uh, work too hard at making it something else. So 2415 tells me that he's talking about a literal man of sin committing a literal abomination of desolation in a literal temple in a literal holy place exactly what they were discussing and talking about there uh, it appears that uh, one of the main reasons jesus tells us to go to uh, daniel is uh, because uh, remember four times in matthew 24 he warns us about deception. Welcome. Come on in. We're just getting started. Sorry. It's okay. No excuses needed. We're just glad you're here. Uh, four times in Matthew 24, he warns us about deception. So evidently, there's something about going to Daniel <coughs> that helps us avoid deception. And I think the reason is, is Daniel gives us details that no other book of the Bible gives us so that when those things happen, we will not be deceived. Uh, so that makes 2415 of Matthew a, a much greater key verse than most people give. It's, it's it like so much hinges on what he says there in that passage. Uh, part of uh, what I call, I call Matthew 24, 15, go to Daniel. <laughs> it's like, okay, stop. That's why I'm calling tonight detour into Daniel. We're going to spend a few sessions in Daniel. 
come back to uh, Matthew 24. But I want to go to, before we go to Daniel 9, I want to go to Daniel 12. Because part of the recommendation of Jesus to go to Daniel includes this in Daniel 12 and 4 through 12. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end, that many shall run to and fro, and all they shall increase. So evidently, a lot of things are sealed until the time of the end. So whenever the time of the end is, and if we are living in the time of the end, we should expect knowledge regarding the time of the end. So many people take verse 4, knowledge shall increase. They say, well, that's the internet, or that's, you know, communication. You can learn a lot more quicker. Whatever, it, whatever about that might mean that is true, he's talking about knowledge shall increase about the time of the end regarding that subject. And then we go down for time's sake, verse 8. Although I heard, I did not understand. So as great as Daniel was, there were some things he did not understand. If you go through Daniel, you'll find that a lot of times, angels had to come to give him the answer. And the angels came only after fasting and prayer, one time for three weeks straight. So answers did not come easily to Daniel. He was a godly man, he prayed all the time, he was close to God. On and on, and he was inspired, you know, on and on and on. And yet, to get the answers, he had to be in really deep, fervent. And most of the time, when he did that, it talks about he woke up sick. He woke up, uh, he couldn't get out of bed, he was so weak. Uh, you know, it tells me that if we really want to know a lot of this information, we're probably going to need to study and pray and be more serious about it than we are. Uh, it's, it's a whole lot more than going on YouTube and watching a few videos of guys who claims they have, claim they have the answers to this. He said in verse 9, although I heard I did not understand, verse 8, then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Isn't that the question we're all asking? <laughs> It, aren't the questions of the disciples at the beginning of Matthew 24 just an enlargement of what Daniel asked here? Daniel said, what shall be the end of these things? That's kind of what the disciples were asking. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up, sealed till the time of the end. Well, in Revelation chapter, starting in chapter 6, we have the unsealing of the sealed book. And we, you know, we talk about what happens during those seven seals that are open. But one thing they are about is they are opening up what was sealed here in the book of Daniel. And they're being unsealed. So a lot of it could be unsealed to individuals ahead of time, but to the whole world it would become unsealed at that time. Many shall be purified, made white, refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. That's kind of how I look at things now. When people want to talk to me about politics or the election or world events or something. I just think of this verse. The wicked are going to do wickedly. That's just their nature. You know, don't be surprised. And none of the wicked shall understand. They're going to be doing things that even they don't understand. But the wise shall understand. So that that knowledge, that revelation. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples, when he said in Matthew 16, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Jeremiah, or some one of the other prophets. Uh, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? They said, Peter said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon for Jonah, for flesh has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So that tells me that true knowledge of the end times must come by revelation. It doesn't come by human reasoning. It doesn't come by human knowledge. <laughs> none of this, you know, none of our effort, really. God has to open our mind and heart to really 
uh, illuminating us to, to the end times. From the time that the daily sacrifice, okay, we'll deal with verse 11 in just a minute. So let's go to Daniel 9, and I'll start making these seven points I want to deal with tonight. <clears throat> We're not really going to deal with all of 24 through 27 tonight because there's too much in it. We're mainly doing what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Go to Daniel, find it, and then study about this event in the book of Daniel. So these are the four passages that speak about the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. I wanted to start with 927 because that's such a familiar passage of prophecy of the 70 weeks in verse 24. And so I, I try to call this diagram, it's not, certainly not professional, I would say that for sure. Uh, but I, I try to take the entire vision, and then it's 70 weeks or 490 years, and then I took each part of it. The start of, of the decree, it's mentioned in 925, and then also 925, it mentions seven weeks of the 70, so 49 years, so that little bit of time. And then the largest part of time is the 62 weeks, or 434 years, also in Daniel 925. And at the end of the 69, 62 of seven, Messiah is cut off. And that's in 926. I make it in 38 D. Within two or three years of that is when most people settle on. And Daniel, in this vision, Messiah shall be cut off, is borrowed from Isaiah 53 A. He shall be cut off from the land of the living. So they're borrowing terminology and language from each other. And then I have that last seven years, the one week. It's maybe not a really good way to show it, but we have it separated off from 69 because there's a gap. At least I believe there's a gap. So in 924, in this passage, 70 weeks are determined, and there's going to be six major things that take place connected to that 70 weeks. And it takes all 70 weeks, including that last week, that last period of seven years that separated off by a long gap between 69 and 70, it takes all 70 weeks to accomplish these six things. And these six things were guaranteed or purchased, you might say, uh, at the cross. They were made sure at the cross and the resurrection, but they will not be completed on a broad scale without the second coming. So a lot of people make 924 to strictly be what Jesus did on the cross, because he did make sure all six of these things, or seven, depends how you divide them. But on, on, on the broadest scale uh, affecting all of creation, uh, it's going to take all 70 weeks, including the seventh day, the millennium, because it's during the millennium that all six of these things will be throughout the whole earth. For instance, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, he can bring in everlasting righteousness to me right now, faith. But throughout the world, he will not bring in everlasting righteousness on a, on a wide scale until he's king during the millennium. So there's kind of a, a dual fulfillment or requires both comings of Christ to accomplish all of these things in 924. So I make that 924 with the red cross under it and then the red arrow down is his returner. And that's, I try to squeeze in those two days of Hosea 6-2. That's the gap. And, and so Hosea 6 2 says, after the two days, in the third day, he will raise us up. So that third day is the return of Christ. 
But this 927 is which what really speaks about the abomination of desolation. And the, the seven points I want to make tonight is regarding that word he. So much of how you view the entire Bible, all of prophecy, the Antichrist, the return of Christ, uh, was it accomplished at 70 AD when Titus and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple? Or is it yet future? Is there a future man of sin? Uh, rebuilt temple, rebuilt, re renewed sacrifices, then he stops those in the middle. Uh, Huge debate, huge debate. Uh, is the he speaking about uh, Messiah the Prince back in verse 25? Or is it speaking about the Prince who is to come in verse 26? And that's where the heart of the debate lies. And it's really interesting. I, I know that a lot of times in prophecy, we want to stay with like the telescope look, you know, look at the big picture, the big events way out there, how they're going to happen. We don't like often in prophecy to look through a microscope at the details. Because, you know, you kind of get bogged down in the details. But 927 is both. It's looking way out there, big events, but you got to look at a lot of little details to figure out uh, is this he confirming a covenant with one week, but in the middle of the week, you shall bring him in to sacrifice and offering. That could be said about Christ, couldn't it? On the cross, in God's eyes, he ended sacrifice and offering of the Jews of the Old Testament in the temple. No longer did they need to offer those animal sacrifices. He is the perfect sacrifice. So I don't know what percentages there are, but it might be the majority, at least worldwide, maybe not in the U.S. But worldwide, the majority probably applies verse 27 to Christ at his death on the cross. That it's a spiritual fulfillment, doing away with the law system of, of the animal sacrifices in the temple and so forth the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. And it seems to fit, doesn't it? Now you think, well, they don't have to make a big stretch to, to get there. But my position is that the he is the Antichrist, that the he is the prince to come in verse 26. And I want to give you seven reasons for that. First of all, I think it's important to see this whole prophecy in the context of the larger Bible, of how it's laid out. By that I mean Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is the, um, what's the language we use today? The unpacking, hear that all the time, so let's unpack this. Uh, maybe a better way is to say expansion. Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is an expansion of Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, that first great prophecy, what does it talk about? I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to Satan, to the serpent. So there's enmity between Satan and everyone who comes after that, humans. Uh, between your seed and her seed. So there's two seeds. Uh, he shall bruise your head, death wound, fatal, permanent. But you shall bruise his heel. You're going to harass him and his people all the way down through history. That's such an important prophecy. This vision is simply enlarging upon that. So the first reason I would say that the he in verse 27 is the prince who is to come is because I see in this prophecy two princes and two covenants. Two princes and two covenants. To show 
the foundation of why I say that, if we go back and look at a couple verses in chapter 8, 8 verse 11. Well, we need to go back to verse 9. Out of one of them came a little horn. And throughout the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, this little horn is the Antichrist. He's the little horn that rises up among the ten that he forms a confederation with. And he starts out as a little horn. Uh, it says in... Uh, Just to give you a reference to that, chapter 11, verse 23, at the end of it, it says, he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. So the Antichrist is called the little horn because he starts out leading a small nation. You know, a lot of those nations in the Middle East are fairly small, but some of them especially because of their super wealth and oil and everything, they carry a lot of weight on the world scene, even though they may only have, you know, a million people population or something. And so he's going to start out as a little horn. But he said as which grew exceedingly great. So, he, you know, his rise is swift. He becomes powerful quickly, even though his beginnings hard not to chase rabbits on a lot of this, but I, I want to keep always trying to bring in when I'm talking about the Antichrist. He is a false Christ. By that I mean he is an imitation Christ. Uh, a uh, uh, what, should, should, what should we say? A counterfeit is the word I'm trying to find. He's a counterfeit Christ. And by that I mean he's always trying to copy something about Christ, but in a false way. So Jesus started out humble beginnings among a small people, a small family in a small place called Bethlehem, grew up in a small place called Nazareth. Humble, small beginnings. He has become great. The Antichrist is going to follow that same path. Start out small, seemingly kind of humble, but then grows exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the hosts, some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. There's a lot in that. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And then we're going to come back to 8, 11 and the rest of that. But I'm just trying to show you there's two princes. He's making himself a prince against the prince of the host, which is Christ. And then in verse uh, 25, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. So these two verses are, they're setting the stage for these two princes, an evil prince and a godly prince. And this evil prince is trying to rise up above the godly prince. So that's the foundation, I think, for chapter 9, verse 27, 26 and 27. There are two princes and this evil prince is trying to overcome the godly prince and his people. There are two covenants. The godly prince, his covenant is verse 24. And I won't take the time tonight to show all of this, but 924 is simply Daniel's rephrasing of Jeremiah's new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, Jeremiah said at first, Jeremiah was the mentor to Daniel. Daniel's just rewarding. So you go read Jeremiah's New Covenant in the various parts of it, and you realize, hey, Daniel's just kind of repeating in his own words. Jeremiah's New Covenant. So this Messiah the Prince 
of uh, verse 25 has a covenant, a new covenant, a godly covenant of 924. And then this evil prince, the prince to come, 926, has his own covenant. And that's, I think, what it's saying in verse 27. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Uh, notice the wording of this. He shall confirm a covenant. It doesn't say he comes up with a brand new covenant. He confirms a covenant. The wording is if it's a covenant already in place. And we're going to get to that in just a minute because I think it is not a brand new covenant. Another way, it literally it says he makes strong a covenant or confirms a covenant that's already in place, one already in existence. Point number two on the outline I gave you, the reason why I think this is talking about two princes, two covenants, and the he in verse 27 is the evil prince, is exactly this line, I drew it this way on purpose. I cannot stress, and it's shocking to me how often I violate it. And it's shocking to me how often other Bible teachers violate this principle of looking at the verse in context. We violate that all the time. So we're looking at line 20, MC, is that, is the he, the godly prince or the evil prince? Is this Christ doing away with the animal sacrifices at his death, or is this the future evil prince confirming a covenant with Israel still yet in the future, and then he's going to break it in the middle of the week? So we're going to you know, look at this verse and try to figure it out. But if we do what Jesus said, when it comes to the abomination of desolation, go to Daniel, find the verses that talk about it, and learn from it. So if we go back to chapter 8, I reread verses 9, 10, and 11 through 13. Uh, look at what it says in verse 11. He, he even, he meaning the little horn, the evil prince, exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. So it's not hard to see in that, is it? There are two princes, there are two people here. One's good and one's evil. And by him, by who? Not the prince of hosts, not the good prince. The one who's exalting himself. By him, the daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of his sanctuary, that's the abomination of desolation, was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. He cast truth down to the ground. Jesus didn't do that. He lifted the truth up off the ground. He did all this and prospered. And I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices? and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. One thing we see in these verses, I know sometimes it's easy to get lost in language, is this is making clear that it's the prince that exalts himself against the prince, the godly prince, that is the one who stops the sacrifices. The other thing I would point out, we'll get to that in just a minute, but we're going to find in, in all of these verses, especially the ones 8 and 11 and 12, the abomination of desolation is always tied together to the ending of the sacrifices. So if you make Daniel 9, 27 to be Christ ending the sacrifices at his death, you have to figure out when is the abomination of desolation during that time. Because they're tied together. 
always in these verses, they're tied together as if they're a single event or very, very close in time. In chapter 11, which is the most extensive description of the Antichrist in the entire Bible, even more than Revelation 13. It says in, what is that, verse 31, and forces shall be mustered by him. Who is the him in this verse? It's the evil prince. Put it in context. And they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes people make a big deal back in 926 that it doesn't necessarily say the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It says the people of the prince. But of course, he has that ten-nation confederation. He's not going to be able, as an individual, to do all that damage. He's going to have to have an army and nations supporting him. So the people of the prince. And that's what verse 31 says. And they shall defile it's not just him mustered by him. Forces shall be mustered by him. So here is the people of the prince. And they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices. So now here's the problem. If you make 927 to be Jesus, the ending the sacrifices at his death. This is saying they are the ones who end the sacrifices. I make it to be the people of the evil prince. Now, some people see this problem of saying that 927 is Jesus ending the sacrifices at his death, and yet this has a group of people stopping the sacrifices. So they say, well, that's Titus and the Romans in 70 AD when they destroyed the temple. Well, is it Jesus on the cross? Or is it the Roman armies in 70 AD? No, can't be both. Some people try to make it both and say Jesus did it spiritually on the cross, and then God used the Romans 40 years later to actually destroy the temple that actually stopped the sacrifices from even being possible. I mean, there's ways of working, whatever your position is, there are ways to work it out if, if, you, if you're insisting on keeping a particular position. They shall defile the sanctuary fortress, then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Is putting the two events together at the same time. So we're starting to run into a lot of difficulties trying to make 927 to be Jesus on the cross spiritually and in sacrifices. Because the abomination of desolation is tied to it. It did not happen to happen. In 1211, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Again, those two events are tied together. And you put all these together and you reach a conclusion that it is an evil prince stopping the sacrifices and setting up the abomination of desolation. So if you make 927 to be Jesus, then you're saying all of these others, speaking about the same two events, are the evil prince, but this is a good prince. No, that's why Jesus said, go to Daniel. We get it sorted out in Daniel. They're all talking about an evil prince removing sacrifices, stop breaking the covenant. This, stopping the sacrifice is just another way of saying breaking the covenant. He's not going to allow them to continue what he allowed them at the beginning of the, of the, co of the covenant, of the agreement. He's going to stop their ability to practice their religion on the temple now. So this key fact of context forces me at least to make it the evil prince. Point number three, we're going to move along real quick. Point number three in 927, 
making it very difficult to make this Jesus spiritually on the cross. It says he makes a covenant with many for one week. Okay, you've got to spiritualize that if it's Jesus on the cross, because he never made a covenant with anyone for seven years. His covenant of 924 is described in many places in the Bible as everlasting. His is an everlasting covenant. If you want a perfect verse for it, it's Hebrews 13 and 20. But it's certainly not limited to seven years. And when we're taking all these 70 weeks of 924 to be 70 periods of seven years. Most everyone agrees with that. Well, how do you come along in verse 27 then and try to spiritualize that 70th week into something different in a little seven years? So Jesus did not make a covenant many for seven years, and he did not break that covenant in the middle of the week. Three and a half years. So, you know, the rule of the Bible is let it be literal if it can be literal. There are times you have to spiritualize, you have to symbolize in a prophecy. You do have to do that on occasion. But let this language just be clear language. It's a seven-year covenant. Uh, people who make this to be Jesus ending the animal sacrifices by his death on the cross, they have to do a lot of... Uh, playing with dates because they make the breaking of this covenant to be in the middle of that seven years. So you have to make his death not to be at the end of 69 years, but at the end of 69 and a half years because he breaks it in the middle of the week. Uh, so what they do is they make his, uh, they make the 69th week to be his baptism. You'll see, if you study this, you'll see it a lot. The end of the 69th week is his baptism. And then three and a half years later of his ministry, he breaks that whole covenant, ends it by his death on the cross. Now, a major problem with that view is what do you do with the last three and a half years? That's a real problem, I see. Because what they're doing is they're making it they're not letting a gap between the 69th and 70. They're saying the 70 weeks are continuous. And, and they'll mock you and make fun of you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you try to put a big gap in there because you don't know what else to do with it. You put this long period of time between 69 and 70 when the language won't allow it. It reads like it should be 70 straight consecutive uh, periods. Well, the problem is with making it consecutive is what happens three and a half years? And then, you know, this vision describes like something like the end of the 70s, the end of the 70th, the end of all of these 70s is like this big dramatic ending. What big dramatic ending do you have three and a half years after the death of Christ? So people say, well, it's the stoning of Stephen. Others say, no, it's the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. You know, they're trying to find some big event but it's like they're having to go fish for it. And so, uh, that, that's a real problem. Point number four, here. Those who make light of a gap, everyone has a gap, and we just say that. If you study prophecy, you're gonna have a gap somewhere along the way. Uh, a lot of people who make the seven weeks continuous, and they say that the uh, destruction of the temple in the city in 70 AD by Titus is the is the completion of all of this 40 years after the death of Christ. Well, that's still a gap, isn't it? It's just a 40-year gap. It's still a gap. So you know, everyone has a gap. When, when Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 11, that the prophets search diligently to study the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. That's the two comings of Christ, isn't it? The sufferings of Christ first, the glories to follow. Uh, there's no language of a gap in that verse, is there? But we know there's a gap. 
from his sufferings to his glory to follow his first coming and the second coming. So there's there's a gap necessary in a lot of prophecy. There's a gap. Most everyone, you know, the, the, this vision was given in like five, let's say five, five thirty-five BC, when it, you know, within a couple years, when Daniel received this vision. Well, what is the starting point of the decree from the vision? Whatever position and date people have, there's a gap to even start it from the time of the vision. There's gaps everywhere. I don't think it should take a lot of time. There's gaps everywhere. Uh, number five. Uh, oh, point number five, I'll just add this point here. This daily, in these three passages, it talks about Daily sacrifice, and if you look real close at those verses, you'll see the word sacrifices is in italics. The actual Hebrew word is just the word daily. And I gave you this as a reference because it really shows it clear. But that word daily is the normal word for the regular twice a day daily sacrifices in the temple. Daniel knew that. The Lord knew that when he inspired it. He's telling him, this is the regular daily sacrifices. So this is just another thing that forces me, even among my own brethren, I did have these discussions many times. Of, You're telling me the Jews are going to get to start animal sacrifices again in the temple? It's like, that is so bizarre, so uh, crazy in this day and age that a religion would have animal sacrifices. And that seems to be a major roadblock, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, I don't think it is. But there's a lot of religions in the world today that have animal sacrifices. And we know when we just allow it. And so some people say, well, it won't really be animal sacrifices because they had grain offerings and they had different kinds of offerings that were not did not require killing the animal. But you know what God instituted into the killing of those animals in the Old Testament? Food preparation. How many animals do we kill for our food every day? Millions. Slaughter. For meat. God provided in those sacrifices that a, a large portion of the meat that was offered as a sacrifice was for the food of the Levites, of the priests. So if you think of animal sacrifices, we offer animals as sacrifices for our daily diet. You know, so we need to think, you know, like change your thinking a little bit. It's not as gross as you want to make it. I do want to say, uh, turn to Daniel 11. This covenant of 927, This covenant of 927 is described in 1128 uh, as a holy covenant. And in verse 30, twice, it's called a holy covenant. But in, uh, let me see where it's at. But in, in 8, I have a written down in my notes. I have so many notes, it's hard to. Now let me find out. It's called a league. Where is that? Well, probably looking right at it. I don't see it. We'll find it eventually. Uh, it's it's called a league to him. It's called a covenant in 927. And it's called a holy covenant in 11, chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. And bring all these up for this purpose. Uh, it's a holy covenant in the sense that uh, to, to Israel. Because when he says, when it says he shall confirm a covenant, 
I go back to what I said. It's a covenant already in existence. What is the covenant to, to, to Israel? What, what is it they will really want those nations to agree to? Number one, Israel's right to exist. Number two, Israel's right to their own land. You know, back in the 40s, when there was a lot of uh, discussion of nations of the world, you know, Israel wanted their own land, wanted their own nation. There were a lot of discussions to give them, like, somewhere in Africa or you know, somewhere else, some other part of the world that there's not many people. You can have that and build your nation there. And they said, no, we're not a nation if we don't have our promised land. So their right to exist, their right to their own land, and their right to access the temple mill in some fashion. And I think all three of those parts, that's the holy covenant, those elements. Antichrist will see it as a leak, or he'll see it as some treaty to be broken. He won't look at it as anything important. But that's what Israel will want in order to sign, sign this agreement. And so those ten nations and Antichrist will agree to it. And uh, then they'll seek to break it, and they will break it three and a half years in. Um, point number six, Israel renews their ancient religion of the Temple Mount. Um, oh, 1123, that's where it says league. I'm not going to give up till I find that. 1123, after the league is made with him. That's a different word than covenant. So he sees it as, as a leak, you know, something to break, something that's necessary at the moment because we're losing the war. And so Israel agrees to it because they get what they want, and the war is stopped for a short time. It says in 927, he'll make it with many. So he makes it with Israel, but, he, but the other ten nations of his confederation sign on to it also. And maybe other nations, you know, I think other major nations around the world will recognize it as being legitimate. And the Antichrist and his group will seek to break it soon. And point number seven, Israel is in order, mortal danger the last three and a half years. We'll get into that more in the future lessons. Uh, but God will protect them and send them into the wilderness, Revelation 12, 6 in 12, 14 through 16. Because uh, I wanted to be sure to close with this thought from 2 Thessalonians. And I want to give you some verses in Daniel regarding 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Pope says in verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, after he said that the man of sin is revealed at the end of verse 3, the son of perdition, that's the evil prince that we were looking at in Daniel. Now look what Paul does. He takes, let me give these verses to you if you want to write them down. He takes Daniel 7, 8. He takes Daniel 8, 25. And he takes Daniel eleven thirty seven. 37. Grabs hold of all those three verses, rewords them, we read some of these already. And this is 2 Thessalonians 2 4. He's just quoting Daniel, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So he tries to elevate himself above the prince of princes, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. So that's the sanctuary that Daniel talks about. That's, this is describing the abomination of desolation, standing and sitting and placed. All of those verbs are used regarding this abomination of the temple. And he does it for the purpose of showing himself that he is God. So because he's quoting Daniel, and Daniel would know nothing other than a literal temple, the disciples of Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives looking at the temple would know nothing other than a literal temple. I take it that Paul means a literal temple. 
I don't spiritualize this living in the church. The Satan's going to come sit in the church, take over the church. All sorts of positions are taken because we just have this like mental opposition to this idea of a literal temple and literal sacrifices of a Jewish religion starting again. It's so foreign to natural thinking that we, we're trying to like force something. i got to force something different of what the temple of God is here. But I think it's this, it's the Paul being Jewish, when he calls it the temple of God, is uh, talking about the same temple Jesus was looking at when he said, when you see the abomination of desolation. I'm going to close by reading and I'll open it up to you. Uh, I have a really interesting, actually I have it downloaded on my computer, I don't have the printed one. A man by the name of P.G.S. Watson, if you want to, you can look it up on the internet and download it if you want. The title of the book is called The Key to Prophecy. And it was written in 1871. And he was called the father of Arkansas Baptist history. But he loved prophecy. And he wrote this in 1871 on page 9. And he's looking at Matthew 24, 15. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. So he asked this question because he was surrounded by people that were trying to make this temple to be the church or some spiritual symbolic meaning other than a literal temple. He says, uh, I quote, Where then is the holy place to which the Lord refers to in Matthew 24, 15? The following considerations may enable us to find the intended spot. Number one, when Jesus spoke these words, he was on Mount Olivet with the Jewish temple in full view. Number two, he had just been speaking of the temple that he was looking at. Number three, in the temple was one room called the holy place and another called the most holy place. Number four, Jesus and the disciples whom he was addressing knew well what those rooms were so named. Number five, there is no just cause for rejecting the known literal holy place and hunting an unknown figurative mark. And that's the position I take. There are many people taking different positions. Uh, Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is the heart of Bible prophecy. I say that uh, it is the unpacking of Genesis 3.15 or enlarging of Genesis 3.15 giving more details. Two princes, two covenants, two peoples. Uh, and then the rest of Bible prophecy is the unpacking of both Genesis 3.15 and Daniel 9, 24 through 27. So it, I call this the heart of Bible prophecy. And you will start endless debates and discussions. If you sit down with someone who, who knows a fair amount about Bible prophecy and say that, Let's talk about Daniel's seven days. And you'll be surprised at the things you hear. But those are, those are the uh, conclusions I have come to. Next session, we're actually going to start trying to develop more particular timeline. This, we're talking about the abomination of desolation. I'd like to draw a timeline of the last seven years. And in the middle of that, I think I have this in the top of our hand now. Yeah, 3.5 years into 3.5 years. So we have a week and we have the middle of the week in Daniel 9.27. Uh, what major events happen in the middle of the week? You might be shocked at the list of major events that happen in the middle of that seven. So I'm going to stop the recordings. Oh no. Hope that hope that took because when I remember